Well, welcome back to part two of this series on Lloyd de Moss. Today we will actually be reading some of his material. In order to understand the general gestalt of de Moss's psychoanalysis that I want to go through in chapter six, we need to start at chapter one. In it, he lays out a very Freudian theory of the connection and impact that mothers have on their children. Of course, his writings here are focused on war and why we go to war. As we'll see, some of it seems plausible, and then often he'll suddenly just jump the shark into absurdity. So, let's start going through it. In the course of researching my book, The Emotional Life of Nations, I discovered that just before and during wars, the nation was regularly depicted as a dangerous woman. I collected thousands of magazine covers and political cartoons before wars to see if there were any visual patterns that could predict the moods that led to war, and I routinely found images of dangerous, bloodthirsty women. Even the most popular movies before wars featured dangerous women, from The Wizard of Oz with its killing witches before World War II, to All About Eve before the Korean War, Cleopatra before Vietnam, Fatal Attraction, and Thelma and Louise before the Persian Gulf War, and Laura Croft and Kill Bill at the start of the Iraqi War. War itself when personified, was always shown as a killer woman, tempting young men with her attractiveness. I called the killer woman a Marie Antoinette syndrome, after the group fantasy of the French during a revolution that she was a, quote, ferocious panther who devoured the French, despite the fact that she was actually a rather sweet person. When the war starts, the terrors in the media that dangerous women are abroad demanding blood are projected into some enemy, who agrees to engage in mutual killing. And oddly enough, the enemy also assumes the killer woman imagery. As, for instance, in the Persian Gulf War, when Saddam Hussein was depicted as a dangerous pregnant mother with a nuclear bomb in her womb, or as the mother of a death baby. That wars are seen emotionally as led by dangerous killer mothers, with war goddesses from Athena to Freya, from Britannia to Marianne, depicted as devouring, raping, and ripping apart her children, is one of my most unexpected findings during the three decades I have studied war psycho-historically. The further back in history one goes, the more wars are openly considered as being fought for killer goddesses, from Tiamat, Ishtar, Inanna, Isis, and Kali, to the Aztec mother goddess, I'm not even going to try to say that who had, quote, mouths all, all over her body that cried out to be fed the blood of her soldiers. Before wars, there is a precise moment when the killer mother image gets split into the good motherland and the bad motherland, and the warrior clings to the good mother even when she sends him to die and be buried in her bosom and kills and rapes enemy women without guilt. Soldiers often say that they are willing to die peacefully, for a beloved motherland, like a baby falling asleep in her womb, wrapped in a maternal dress or flag. Wars are, from their beginning, experienced as direct repetitions of the birth struggle, begun when nations are smothered and unable to take a breath, continuing until they can see the light at the end of the tunnel, and even aborted if ended too soon. As the German proverb puts it, Germany is never so happy as when she is pregnant with war. Even the nuclear bomb is seen as part of a rebirth ritual. The Hiroshima bomb, named Little Boy and dropped from the belly of a plane named after the pilot's mother, was announced as successful by General Groves, who cabled President Truman, the baby was born. Wars are thought of as being fought mainly by men against men, but most wars kill more women and children than men. Today, for every soldier who dies in war, ten civilians die, about half of them children. Most war leaders and most soldiers are male, and somewhat more women than men oppose going to war. Women are far more likely to be the victims of violence than men. In the U.S. in 1980, one out of every two women experiences some form of battering. One of four experiences incest, one in four is raped, 97% of all male-female violence is against females. 
if, as feminists of all stripes contend, violence and militarism are simply patriarchy writ large, why are motherlands the central focus of emotional group fantasies about war? The answer is clear. All these dangerous women and killer motherland fantasies are mainly those of men. It is mainly men who kill under the delusion that, quote, we have laid ourselves over the body of the motherland in order to revive her. Or, we are to die so that the motherland may live, for while we live, the motherland is dying. It is men who, as officers, refer to themselves as the company mother, or as the mother hen watching the other guys like they was my children. It is men who join the military to appeal to women as brave heroes who will save them, who respond to military posters saying, Women of Britain, say go, who claim, quote, all women like to hear of men fighting and facing danger, and who go to their death in battle with one word, mom, on their lips. Mothers today may not send their sons forth to battle with the adjuration, come back with your shield or on it, as did Spartan mothers, but in fantasy, many soldiers still hear the inner voices of their mother saying to them, grow up and be a man, i.e., kill or be killed. War leaders know the killer motherland group fantasy that moves men to war, and they repeat it endlessly before and during wars. Hitler spoke of German devotion to their motherland thousands of times in his speeches, saying, I promise you the sacrifice of 10 million German youth to Germania. Hitler said he was literally married to Germania. Marriage is not for me and never will be. My only bride is my motherland. And this is the reason he did not marry any other woman. This was an old idea for the military. Before modern mass armies, soldiers were usually prohibited from marrying since they were considered as wed to their motherlands and units. Goebbels confirmed that, quote, the entire people loves him because it feels safe in his hands like a child in the arms of a mother. Hitler's conviction that he got his power from his mother was so literal that he kept pictures near his desks of both his actual mother Clara and of Medusa, whose gaze turned people into stone. Hitler said of the painting of Medusa, They are the eyes of my mother. Medusa was so deadly that one look from her could kill you. Hitler endlessly practiced before a mirror, so his eyes would be killing mother eyes, like those of his own deeply depressed mother. Staring at his Nazi soldiers, Hitler could empower them to also be fused with the powerful killer mother, saying, I want to see again in the eyes of youth the gleam of the beast. Now I'm going to skip a little bit, okay? That real French mothers at the time of the revolution were actually killers is a well-hidden secret of most historians. Maternal infanticide was called the most common crime in Western Europe from the Middle Ages down to the end of the 18th century. In my own extensive research on historical infanticide rates, as revealed by boy-girl sex ratios from census and other sources, showed about a third more boys were allowed to live than girls meaning most children grew up watching their mother strangle and throw into the outhouse at least two of her newborn babies, embedding in their psyches a clear picture of their killer mother. Since the wealthy killed their children at even higher rates than the poor, the high infanticide rates were not mainly due to poverty, but they reflected real attitudes toward children. Newborn were killed because daughters were less preferred, because Devils or demons had told them to kill the baby because the baby was needed as a foundation sacrifice and sealed into a new building or bridge to ward off angry spirits or dozens of other rationalizations. Mothers who allowed their newborns to live usually shipped them off to wet nurses. At the time of the French Revolution and throughout the 19th century, mothers in Paris deported to distant parts of the countryside 90% of their newborn usually in appalling conditions, and seldom inquired about their survival. They were called angel makers because they so often let the child die. Only about a quarter of the children lived to be returned strangers to their parents. Women who refused to nurse their babies did not mince words. It bores me, and I have better things to do. It's too messy. I don't want to ruin my figure, etc. 
During their time at wet nurse, the child is left to himself, drowning in his own excrement, bound like a criminal in tight swaddling bands, devoured by mosquitoes and lice. Since the children were not returned to their parents for four or five years, and since they were sent to other families as servants at six or seven, few parents actually raised their children in history until recently. One can understand Talleyrand's statement that he never had to sleep under the same roof with his father and mother. Mothers agreed during Christian times that their infants were so evil that they were inclined in their hearts to adultery, fornication, impure desires, anger, gluttony, hatred, and more. So this meant they had to be tightly bound in yards of swaddling bands and brutally beaten daily beginning as babies. Thus, it is not surprising to find illustrations of going to war as a process of offering up your evil children's lives to the killer motherland. When the children were growing up, they were threatened by images and even actual dummies dressed up as evil witches, who, if they were not totally obedient to the mother, would tear them to pieces, suck their blood, and eat them up. These evil witches are the earliest forms of the killer motherland who demand your blood and your life in war. The use of mask figures to frighten children goes back to antiquity. It was said by Dio Chrysostom that terrifying images deter children when they want food or play. One nurse reported making up a huge figure with frightful staring eyes and an enormous mouth and placed it at the foot of the bed where the little innocent child was fast asleep. When she returned, the little girl was sitting up in her bed, staring in an agony of terror at the fearful monster before her. She was stone dead. That children who have experienced all these kinds of severe early traumas relive them in group fantasies of war as adults is hardly surprising. Skipping around a little more now. <laughs> Here's something a little kooky. That'll probably irritate the Catholics, or maybe you agree with it. I, I don't know. The religious wars of the Middle Ages were fought by warriors who put the Virgin Mary on their shields and prayed, Mary, Mother of our Savior, obtain for us, your children, the grace of a happy death, so that in union with you we may, we may enjoy the bliss of heaven forever. Amen. Icons of Mary and Byzantium depicted her as a general who fights the enemy by sending her trusted warriors into battle and killing, and herself killing them outright. All of Europe begged the Pope to allow them to take part in the Crusades because they were promised that if they died in battle, they would earn remission of their sins and be fused in unio mystica with Killer Mother Mary or with Jesus Our Mother, a popular medieval fantasy. Constantine even made Jesus a soldier who fought for the Roman Empire, and many popes thereafter spoke of soldiers of Christ or knights of Christ in his army who earned salvation by killing infidels for Christ. Knights were full-time warriors, killing whoever happened to be nearby and ravaging bands of killers, and the knights in their bloody tournaments were always watched by an audience of adoring females who urged their men to kill for imagined slights. To their honor. Mothers in particular were expected to urge the knights to go on to kill. These medieval duels often restaged the maternal traumas of childhood. For instance, mothers in medieval times often squeezed the penis of their boys to toilet train them, so knights traditionally considered a squeeze of their noses to indicate a challenge to a duel. The knight's costume repeated the brilliant colors, feathers, and swishing cloth of their mothers. And, as one scholar put it, for centuries European war was an odd spectacle of men dressed in fancy clothes trying to kill one another. See, this is one of the leaps in um, credulity that I'm talking about. All right, we're going to skip around a little more. Give me a second... Okay, so he spends a little while talking about the Aztec societies and how they treated their children, which, you know, go figure, wasn't great. And then he talks about the Kung Bushmen. Now, I don't know very much about, um, you know, 
how to pronounce all the African crap, but I'm pretty sure that was a click or something that you're supposed to put whenever you see an exclamation point. So you'll see here, he says, tribal groups like nations get into their killing moods by fusing with a maternal spirit. The infanticidal child rearing of tribal societies is generally downplayed by anthropologists who have idea who have idealized tribal mothering as badly as historians have idealized mothers before the 20th century. Most academics by now are familiar with how Margaret Mead left out how Samoan girls were routine, routinely raped, which she represented as being sexually free. But until my journal of psychoanalytic anthropology began to be published, and until my book The Emotional Life of Nations came out, few realized how much anthropologists distorted mothering in their tribes. Infanticide was so widespread that few children grew up without seeing several of their siblings killed by their mother at birth. Mead kept infanticide out of her published reports, but wrote in her letters home, quote, We've had one corpse float by, a newborn infant. They are always throwing away infants here. What is more, in many tribes, the mothers ate every other newborn out of baby hunger and forced their other children to eat parts of their siblings too. When I wondered how the anthropologist Rohim could report this and still insist on calling them good mothers, he insisted that they really were good mothers who eat their own children. Mothers say they kill their newborn because children are too much trouble, because they are demon children, because they, are angry at, they were angry at their husbands, or because the baby might turn out to be a sorcerer. Sometimes the mothers even implicate older children in their infanticide, as one Kung woman's memory of her mother telling her when she was four that she had to help bury her newborn brother so that she can continue to nurse. I'm going to skip down a little bit to the last sentence in this paragraph. Tribal mothers routinely kill, abandon, starve, batter, kick, burn, frighten with ghosts, use sexually and give away their children to strangers, and anthropologists like Mead and Sostock still call them devoted mothers. One can clearly see an example of the bias anthropologists' evidence against admitting maternal child abuse in the authoritative Growing Up, a cross-cultural encyclopedia, which after dozens of anthropologists say that they found many examples of normative adult child sexual contact in each tribe, including mothers masturbating children. But this would not constitute abuse if in that society the behavior was not prescribed. So they report no sexual abuse in the 87 cultures they examined where mothers stroke, masturbate, and suck their child's genitals because this would not constitute abuse if in that society the behavior was not prescribed. When they become adults, they have, of course, internalized their infanticidal, abandoning, brutal mothers as flesh-devouring female witches or shamans who direct their homicides and war raids to protect themselves from the spirits. The tribal leader is, of course, usually a male, since females are so little trusted, but his role is clear in the saying about a physically powerful leader. When the chief's breasts are full of milk, it is his people who drink. They are usually a variety of schizoid personalities, moving easily back and forth from affection to attack, saying to their child, Do you love your new baby brother? Why don't you kill him? As adults, they can be overly hospitable to you at one moment and then try to kill you the next with little cause, since to, you, since to them you have suddenly turned into a witch. They are constantly in fear of fusing with their mother's menstruating vagina, which as children they were made part of during naked sleeping in the menstrual hut. So during tribal raids, warriors became the symbolic equivalent of menstruating women, since both bloody warriors and menstruating women were charged with powerful, destructive energy. Warriors' bodies and weapons were decorated with designs marked in red hematite, and they expropriated the destructive power of menstruating women by ritual nosebleeding or sub-incision of their penises. Tribal myths 
often openly make the link between killer mothers and tribal wars. The Sambia say, Numbulu's wife, Chenchi, killed her first male child. Because she killed the first male child, we now fight war. But even in tribes, it is mainly males who fight the wars and mainly males who lead the attacks. Why is this so across all cultures and across all of history? Are males really born more violent, as many claim? Or are males treated worse as they grow up, leading to more violent defenses later on? In the next chapter, we will examine the evidence for differential inheritance and differential early treatment of boys and girls, and then go on in future chapters to describe how common these early terrors of abuse and abandonment are, and how they became imprinted into the emotional parts of the brain, and under what conditions they emerge in adulthood to cause the, fu the fusion with the violence of the killer mother to be acted out in wars and terrorism. So there you go. That's chapter one. Next video, we will do chapter six, and I will see you all then. Peace.